No turning back. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance. This is Weekly Scrap, number 79. Tonight's guest is Dr. David Griffin. And just a fair warning, buckle up for this intro. He is a lot of information to throw at you. Shift commander in Charleston, South Carolina. He was the operator of the first new engine on June 18, 2007, when nine of his fellow firefighters perished in the line of duty. He has come through the ranks from firefighter, assistant engineer, engineer, captain, battalion chief, all the way up to where he currently is as shift commander. Uh, he has a bachelor of science, master's of science in executive fire service leadership, a doctorate in organizational leadership and development. He's the author of a best-selling in honor of the Charleston Nine, a study of change following tragedy, as well as four other books covering topics from personal growth, dealing with PTSD, your personal journey in dealing with line of duty deaths, and also the healing power of tattoos. International speaker, instructor, uh, graduate of the Executive Fire Officer Program, the National Fire Academy, and recently selected to go to Harvard's Ken University, uh, stuff I don't even know about, School of Executive Education that you'll start in July. So it's impressive. Uh, and also the run you got, we run on a mission. Uh, so all that being said, it's my pleasure, Dr. David Griffin to have you on today as the guest of weekly scrap number 79. Welcome, sir. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. To everyone watching live, if you have questions or comments for David or myself, please do not hesitate to send them in the comments. Is there anything I missed or anything you want to add? No, I always say when that's read that really nobody cares and I couldn't have done any of that without the people I work with and uh, them leading me and showing me the way and giving me the experience and the knowledge. And um, you said before that for some people that's intimidating and it's intimidating for me because it's unfortunate when people read that they think I actually care about any of that and I don't. The, the, the number one thing that I care about is that I still ride a rig um, with people in Charleston. There's 68 of us that are still riding after the event. And really that means more to me than anything that you just read on that piece of paper. Right on. It's powerful. All right. I'm going to lead off right out the gate and talk about on a mission. Um, Cause when I, I don't know you personally, you know, uh, I'm having you on as a guest of the scrap, but from the outside looking in, it seems like on a mission is your call. You are a firefighter. There's no doubt of that. You know what I'm saying? And you're a driven individual. On a mission, what is it, and how did it start, and its history, et cetera? On a mission is the way I live my life, from uh, how I get up in the morning to how I go to work to what I do in my free time to my hobbies. Whatever I'm doing, it's to, got to be to the full uh, 100%, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad, but that's just who I am. Um, if I'm taking a class, I want to take the class as best as I can and, and learn as much as I can from the class. If I'm surfing a wave at the beach, I want to surf the biggest wave, the most dangerous wave, and put myself in that position because I think that's – what makes me who I am. And that just led me into um, a unique opportunity. I've been very fortunate and blessed um, after a very tragic event that happened in Charleston. And I'm very cognizant of that every day. I don't take it for granted. And that's how I live my life, basically. That's why I'm sitting here doing this podcast with you. I I'm honest when I teach. I'm honest when I do these podcasts. I don't want to be doing this podcast. I don't want to teach. I don't want to write books. I don't want to write articles. Uh, but I do it because I have a responsibility to do what I feel for what we went through as an organization, but what I went through personally with post-traumatic stress, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, things that I did. And I was becoming frustrated because I saw people talking about it uh, on a national stage that weren't from our organization or did not go what we went through. And they were speaking for us, the guys that are still on a rig riding every day. And so that's really what my mission became. And that's what I do every single day. I go to work for my 24 hour shift, uh, my two days off, I'm focused on something that does with on a mission, whether I'm uh, talking to someone on a podcast or talking to somebody on the phone uh, that's close to committing suicide. I do that a lot, too, because I get some phone calls from people that know my, my background in mental health. And it's something that is my motivation and it's why I get up for every single day. No, it's powerful, man. That really is. Um, so I'll, I'll segue off on a mission right into uh, I want to just talk a lot about leadership with you, but and what you've learned. But I'm going to start off with preparing our people because you wrote a really cool piece that did the analogy of a minor league versus the major leagues. And it was such a good analogy because uh, I feel like there's a problem in the American fire service where we, uh, mo maybe there's exceptions, but most organizations just kind of take an officer and say, okay, congratulations. You're the officer. Go lead people. Right. That happens a lot. And, you know, we did that as an organization before June 18th and it wasn't because we were bad people. It was the way that we were accustomed to our leaders and over time, we developed some programs with officer development 
and some ways to send our folks back to school and to get some courses on leadership. But the most important thing about that is honestly, I've gone through a lot, as you know, from leadership, 12 years of school of leadership, but I've learned more in the last few years uh, being in operations and really leading from a position to where I'm working with a multi-generational environment um, to improve my leadership skills, but also uh, learn from other people because a lot has changed in leadership, not just in the fire service, but in organizations around the globe, because more is servant leadership, more is principal leadership. For a long time, if you were the leader, you had to know everything, you had to have the answer, and there was really no feedback from the people that you served. And if you notice what I said, you served. The people that you serve are not there to make your life easier, to make your day better. You're there to do that for them. And I always have believed that, and I believe that every single day I go to work, because without those people I work with, I am absolutely nothing. I am not good at my job. I am not helpful. Without those individuals doing what they do every single day, there is no followership. There is no leadership. It's all fake. And so that's why I'm so focused with a new uh, thought process of leadership. I came from the, the Military College of South Carolina, the Citadel, and we focused on something called principal leadership. It was having a code. It was having a principle for why you do what you do, why you go to work, why you wear a uniform a certain way why you have a clean haircut, why you're shaving, all of those things. Nice. And it's just something that I really believe in. And I'm not saying everybody has to be identical. I have learned that as well as, as progressing as a leader. I like individuality. I like people to have a personality because they're able to be themselves. They're able to um, use different theories they've learned in different courses and are not afraid to be who they are. And if you stymie these people's growth by telling them they have to be like a robot every single day at work, it's not fun for anybody. I want people to have fun. I want people to look different. I want people to throw ladders different. All of that, because that really makes you a more holistic organization. Nice. The, where's my pull up? It's not who is right. It's what is right. I love this from you. You talk about a lot about servant leadership and ego. So I want to hear I learned, again, I learned that, you know, 17 years old, I went to a military college and I had, you know, 150 people that scared, the, scared me half to death yelling at me, trying to teach me how to be a leader. And that's an experience that I've been blessed to have in my life. So I learned that at a very young age, but I also learned in school that it, it's not who's right, it's what's right. And that's something I've carried on in my career. If you make a mistake as a leader, you have to own that mistake and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but I'm going to make it better. When you don't do that and you don't get in front of it and you don't be the leader with that, everybody knows you made a mistake. Right. Anytime I make a mistake, I'm going to I'm going to say I made a mistake and this is why I did it and I'm going to learn from it. I, it doesn't hurt my feelings to say that. It doesn't embarrass me. Um, it actually embarrasses me when people can't do that because I, I, I feel like I don't understand why that's so difficult to do in our environment today when our environment has changed so much to a better understanding of people. There's so much diversity in the workforce, which is great. There's so much inclusivity today, but we're still afraid to say we made a mistake and that we need help to figure things out. And I do that as the shift commander. I'm very blessed. I have an awesome team of BCs that we work well together. The fun thing about that is they're all senior to me. And all those guys taught me how to be in this position. One of the guys I call him my consigliere, if you've ever watched the mafia. Right. Godfather, you know what that is, but he literally is that. When I have a, a situation where I'm trying to figure something out, I call him on the phone and I ask him questions because I know he's a valuable asset to me. I know the guy that's in another battalion that was born and raised and lives in that battalion. He lives there today. He's done his entire career there. I know he has value because he's from that area. I know the other battalion chief I have has huge value because his brother is in the department as well. And they've come through the ranks together in 20 years. That's the value that you have to find in your leaders. And unfortunately, I've been to so many organizations and I've seen that that's just not the case. Sometimes it's, you know, what is it? What looks good on this piece of paper or um, the, their experience isn't there and they still get into these positions to where it really hurts an organization. And it's really uh, disappointing to see at times. The main thing about who, it's not who's right, it's what's right is if someone comes to you that's below you in rank, I, I don't care about rank. And people know I say that all the time. If they have a better idea than you do, listen to the idea. We've had a couple of weeks where we've had some situations and literally the captains in the battalion that I'm responsible for, they have solved their own issues. Literally have come to me and said, chief, this is what we want to do. Great idea. Let's do it. And they do it. That is how you build that camaraderie. 
That is how you build that work performance because they know they can do their job. They don't need me to tell them what to do. These are adults. They know what to do. They might need a little guidance here and there, but so do I. I'm just like them. I'm just at a different level of responsibility. Nice. Oh, I like that. I like that. I'm just like them, just different level of responsibility. Um, perfect. I wanted. I want to touch on something you said there, but I'm going to catch you up from from the uh, from the audience. And we're going here. Jacob Johnson said, "Been to his class three times. Chief Griffin is legit. We got a lot of awesomeness." This is a man that's living with a purpose. Dennis Riley checked in and said, I've been looking forward to this. All my best to David. There we go. A lot of, lot of love coming at you. Dr. Griffin's message is one of the most powerful in the fire service. And glad to be here tonight. Thank you, Chief, for coming on. That's from Absolutely. Robert McClellan. So there we go. I caught you up on uh, a lot of love coming at you. Now, you touched on um, you know, the BCs that you have that actually have more time on. Uh, but it, to me, I, 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 what, I, what I hear you talking about is the relationships that you have formed with them. And how important those are. Absolutely. I mean, they're, I mean, they're so, they're so important to our team without them. Uh, we would not be a team. And I, and I knew that being blessed to be able to come into the position that I am that without them leading me, I mean, I fought fire with those guys. Right. The first fire I had as an acting battalion chief mentoring, not even acting. Now I was mentoring, which means I was going through 10 shifts to practice as a BC. I rode with the consigliere who nice. I call the consigliere. He was my first live fire as an incident commander, he was sitting in the passenger seat telling me what to do, giving me guidance. And I never forget that because that's important. Without that guidance he gave me, without the knowledge he gave me, I wouldn't be in the position I am today. And I feel sometimes in the fire service, we forget about that. We get to these positions or these ranks that everybody think is so important. And we forget uh, what really our, our mission is to serve the people that we work with. And, and that's why I'm so adamant about that our team is awesome we text all day long on shift or off shift um and just talking massive trash like we do <laughs> it's beautiful right uh, two of them are like a married couple and i love it because they're absolutely best friends they work together and uh but the value they bring to the team is just uh it's, it's invaluable because without them we would not function so cohesively that's awesome now did you have a strong relationship with them before you promoted or did you come okay I did. So with the, my consigliere, and I'm not saying their name because it's not fair to them. Sure. If they don't want to be said. But the consigliere, um, yes, I, I drove for him. I was a firefighter on the back of an engine with him. He taught me how to do pump operations. He taught me how to drive a ladder truck. Nice. Um, the other individual in another battalion, I drove for him quite a few times as an acting captain. Uh, and then when he was a captain, I drove as an assistant engineer. And then obviously the other battalion chief that's on our team, um, I drove for him as well on engines um, and we were downtown together at a specific station on a different shift, but yes, we weren't as close as we are now because we didn't have that day, day to day uh, sure. work relationship. But I mean, there were three guys I always looked up to and I wanted to, you know, hopefully one day be a part of their team. And now that's the case. And it's, it's a lot of fun every day. I, I can't wait to get to work. Sounds, I can't wait. Sounds like, no, no. And that, that's so key. When you, when people love coming to work, a lot of stuff falls into place. The, uh, one thing I did hear though, when you said, you said it earlier was, uh, uh, whoever has the best idea, they bring it to you and say, Hey chief, we want to try this. You say, yeah, go for it. Now that, that's a lot of trust. You know, you have a lot of trust obviously in your guys and they obviously have a lot of trust in you. Uh, yeah, what, I think trust is essential without trust. You don't have anything. I think, uh, team is always built on trust. And I've been a part of a lot of teams in my life playing college baseball, professional baseball, I was a part of a mixed martial arts uh, team because we trained together and we trusted each other. And that's something that I, I preach a lot is if, if we don't have that trust, then how can we actually function as a very high um, functioning team? Right. And, and that's something that we really talk about a lot. And I, I do trust them because they're adults. They, they've done really good work in Charleston. They've learned. And I will say they're better than I ever was as a captain. I tell them that all the time because I believe they are. They have gone through a lot more rigorous training than I did coming through the ranks. They've taken a lot more classes. They have a lot more stipulations placed on them to go to the next level. And I take that as a lot of value because I realize that they've seen some things from a different perspective than I have. And I think that perspective is super important for me to take a step back and look at uh, because when I do that, I see things differently. I see it from their eyes as a captain from when I was a captain sure. and it makes my decision process a little bit slower and, and more rational in the moment. And with the BCs, um, that is critical because they have, they have been doing it longer than I have. Right. And so many things I have questions on 
I can shoot that mass text out and they all three have different ideas. Then we talk about it. We may get on a conference call. We do FaceTime conference calls all the time, work through things. And then we come to that decision together. And I always say that together. It doesn't matter that I'm the responsible person. We make the decisions as a unit of four BCs for that shift, because I believe that's how it should be. Even though I'm responsible for our, if we fail, I'm responsible. If we do great, those guys did the work because that's how I believe it. And that's how, I'll always believe it as being a leader. That's awesome, man. And to hear that coming from, you know, the, the shift commander is awesome. And I can only imagine what it'd be like to work for you. So what I want to ask is, um, what would you say to someone obviously that is not, does not have you as the shift commander or the battalion. They have someone who is more, let's say tyrannical or more, uh, this is my power. You serve me. How, how, what, what, what would be your advice to deal with that kind of situation? Well, in my organization, we're, I'm very blessed. We don't have anyone like that. So our shift commanders, the other two shift commanders we have, they're very easygoing. Nice. We have a great working relationship together. The BCs that we have are top notch. And so I'm very blessed to see that. But I, you know, I've been to six, 700 different organizations teaching on leadership. And um, I've seen some individuals that present that just in a class, just in group discussions, talking about servant leadership and principal leadership. And I've had people make the statement, you know, they've made this statement of they're the leader and they don't have to serve anybody. It's the other way around. And that really, it baffles my mind. And I start getting to the conversation. I start asking pointed questions and it comes back to not having the confidence in your leadership style. And, and I think that's what it has to do with. If you have a lot of confidence in the way that you lead and the belief you have in your people, there's really no reason for you to have to tap your badge or say, I'm the chief or I'm the leader. Um, I just don't see a huge point in that because you really don't get anything out of it. And people don't really respect that. I want them to respect you as a person, as a leader, and really want to work with you, not for you. And that's a big change of the way that you word that is I work with over a hundred people on my shift. They don't work for me. I don't, I work for them, but we work together. And I think that's something that we've missed for a long time, just holistically in the fire service. No doubt about it, man. No doubt about it. Uh, Tony Nunez chimed in and said, the best leader makes the people they are leading better than them. And Marshall Boyd said, responsible, in quotation marks, responsible for, not in charge of, words matter. And that's, that's beautiful. Uh, I'd like to go back to what the first comment was. He said, uh, repeat that first comment. Uh, from Tony, he said, the best leader makes the people they are leading better than them. Absolutely. I've been to a lot of organizations, like I said, very blessed and very lucky, but I've actually seen been to organizations that they don't want people below them to be better than them because they find them as a challenge or as competition. And I, I've always just, it's, it's always baffled me. I don't see anyone that I work with as a competition with me. I see myself in competition with myself. I want them to be better. Right. I want one of the captains and off of our shift to one day be a battalion chief or be the shift commander or be the deputy chief or the fire chief. If that means they surpass me, then that's awesome. I'm going to take them out for a steak dinner and we're going to enjoy it together because I was a part of their growth and their success. And that's really what I, I that makes me more excited than anything. When I see one of our guys make driver or engineer or captain, that, I'm more excited than if I get promoted. Because at the end of the day, that doesn't mean much to me. Like what means to me is to see the people that have gone through so much in a 14 year period, get to where they've always wanted to be. And I think that's what we have tried to do together in our organization. That's awesome. Uh, CJ Smith said I was in Dr. Griffin's class last week in Charlotte and he was honestly, he has honestly changed my whole viewpoint about how I go about the job. Uh, Lee Dunham says a great leader leads from the front and you're only as good as your weakest member. So all good points. And I want to say, if you guys have questions for Dr. Griffin or myself, uh, send the questions in the comments and I will throw them at him. So don't waste your chance to throw questions. Um, back to you. I want to talk about one quote I wrote down was about organizations developing into dynamic learning organizations. It's a quote you had in one of your articles. I didn't, I didn't put down the quote, but I love the, the, the wording of it, which is just when an organization can develop into a dynamic learning organizations. Can you uh, expound upon that? Absolutely. So a dynamic learning organization is something that's been taking place for hundreds of years. And a lot of that comes from something called organizational crisis. So we'll use a couple of different examples. You had Hurricane Katrina, you had massive um, issues with the response in that area. And from that crisis, organizations learn from other organizations to improve the way they operate in future hurricanes and um, tragedies such as that. 
use another one, 9-11. There's so many things that we talk about from 9-11 that was changed the way that we respond, but also changed the way that we fight terrorism in our country. And the one I really focused on was NASA uh, when they had the issues with the Columbia and the Challenger incident. They learned so much from those incidents that allowed them to become a, uh, a powerful learning organization to where they give that information to other people. And that's what I consider us um, in Charleston is that we're a, a, a learning organization that we try to spread that message of what happened in Charleston because there's not a lot of people that have gone through a multiple line of duty death they lose nine firefighters. And then after that, uh, 14 years later, there's only 68 of the 246 still on the job from that day. That's a massive uh, loss of good people in our organization. I saw so many good people, good leaders, people I looked up to that I wanted to be just like um, that, that had to leave the organization due to retirement or just issues from the fire. And, and that was difficult. But from that, we learned how to combat stress. We learned how to combat the mental health issues that follow an event like this. We put into place a peer support team, uh, counseling services, and there's a lot of people today that still use that. And there's a lot of organizations that have counseling services and a peer support team because of what we did after our line of duty death. Far reaching. The, uh, you have a very unique perspective. Um, and I'm not just talking about the tragedy of the super sofa fire, but in the fact that you have existed on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, and I say that because you're, you are plugged in hard charging, learning, training person that we know. And then you're, you've also been the guy who was resistant to change or, you know, other, put it into your own words. But basically, uh, talk to me about how that unique perspective has been an advantage or disadvantage to you and how you've used it to connect with people and so on. It's been an interesting journey, I will say. I know when you look at me on this podcast, you see I'm really uh, serious and you probably think I'm, I'm half mad the way that I look, but I'm a very, I'm a very jokester, happy-go-lucky type of guy. But when I'm talking business, I'm talking business because – um, we went through something in Charleston that not a lot of people went through. And it was hard to sit back and watch other people that did not go through that chastise you and, and, and call you an ignorant backwoods firefighter and make fun of the way that you did things when a lot of them were doing the same thing. And the difference was we just unfortunately had a tragedy and they never got caught. And that's something I try to articulate to people because there's a lot of places that didn't follow a national best practice or they didn't have the best SOPs, but they were still functioning on the history of their organization and they were successful. And we were successful for a long time. Right. We had good people in our organization that we didn't want this to happen, but it's a part of an organization that when you have a tragedy like this, that you have to learn from it and make it better. And from that in 14 years, you have to imagine what we've been through with the amount of fire chiefs we've had, um, the amount of leadership staffs we've had, the amount of recruits that have come through our organization, uh, the massive amounts of change and apparatus and equipment and leadership styles. These are things that people can't live through uh, in five years on the job. These are things that people can't live through in 30 and 40 years on the job. I truly believe that we have a unique experience that we can help a lot of people with if, if people are willing to listen. And that's why a lot of us are so passionate about this because we really want people to understand that this can happen to any organization at any time. And just unfortunately um, it happened to us and, and we've tried to make it better since then. And, we, and we've done that. No doubt. Uh, Lee Hopkins said, how did you deal with all the backseat quarterbacks after the fire? What was the biggest challenge to build the department back up? That was one of the hardest parts is, we had a lot of things after the fire that were being published online. This is really about the time that blogs were started and websites with chat rooms. And there was a few of those that we were getting um, hit pretty hard. And, you know, I was getting verbally abused on there and they were saying I was the pump operator that didn't know what he was doing. And um, while that was true and I live with that every single day, that um, it, it hurts because I did not know that at the time. I, I, I was so ignorant to, the position that I was in at that time, I didn't take the job serious. And that's something that I pay for every single day. And um, it was difficult because people, they did Monday morning quarterback. They did ask you, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you have that? And I really didn't have any answers for them because I didn't have a lot of experience. I was two years on the job. I was trying to figure it out as I went, but it beat me down a lot. And then all these uh, reports started to come out and they were really straightforward and they should be. And I read those and I was so disappointed in myself because I realized that I, I didn't function as I should have that day. And, and I, I live with that. You know, I, 
people say they have tinnitus and you know what tinnitus is the ring in the ears right. i have tinnitus of michael french saying dave charged the line engineer 11 charged the line because that's what he said that was really literally his last words he said before he died and that's hard for me and i don't think people i don't think people understand that when i I drive through a call. I see this over Superstore. When I'm doing incident command, I hear it, and then I come back to what I'm doing because of, obviously, the counseling that I was able to attain and the people around me that didn't give up on me and quit on me and kick me to the curb. Um, they still wanted me around, and I'm appreciative of that because I was the opposite end of the spectrum. I was coming to work yelling at people. Um, I was disrespecting people. I came to work with a pink mohawk. I covered myself in tattoos. I was angry. I was... Um, my off days, I was drinking a lot and it was just, it wasn't a good time, and, but somebody there saw something in me and they, they got me focused. And then everybody um, that was close to me tried to help me. The captain at the time, he knew I was struggling and um, he's still on the job there and he's a good friend of mine. And he really made me wake up and realize I needed to do something different. And I think with that, I was able to overcome all of those the, all the negativity, but it, it, you got to realize it, it's not just a, it's not me. There's, there's 68 of us and there's over 246 that struggle with this every single day, whether they're on the job or not on the job, they wake up and they hear it. They feel it. It's, and it's, it's heartbreaking to me that we all have to go through this on a daily basis um, because it never goes away. And I think some people believe that, you know, 14 years later, ah, you get over it, you'd be fine live it and then come talk to me and tell me how you get over it because you won't get over it. And that's the misconception that we have of people that haven't been through something like that. Right. No, it's powerful, man. Um, Matt Wallace said in your presentation, one thing that stuck out to me was your statement. The only difference between me and you is one call, which is kind of what you've talked about here. And he said, however, daily fire departments are battling this complacency. What would be your number one thing to say to people in an organization that are complacent and just haven't been caught yet? Well, it's not just about the fire service. Organizations worldwide are becoming complacent. It's not because they're bad people. It's part of human behavior. They're, everybody on this call right now has been complacent one or two times in their life. It's the timing that you become complacent. You may get lucky and get complacent on a day you get no calls. You have no structure fire. You have no riot. You have no car wreck. But the day you get complacent and you have a high rise fire, you have um, an active shooter event, you have a major event, that's when it changes your perspective because you realize you went 30 years with nothing and then 30 years in one day, you had something. But again, it doesn't make you a bad person. The people that learn are the people that look on past events and they learn from them to realize that you're just one call away from that. That's the only difference. One call will change the rest of your career and literally the rest of your life. I would not be sitting in front of the Zoom video if it wasn't for June 18, 2007. I would not be awarded the, the, the knowledge that I have today after that event if it wasn't for that tragic event. The people that I work with would not be feeling what they feel every day if it wasn't for that tragic event. And that's what we all have to remember. So why would we not bond together as a fire service and learn about June 18, 2007? Learn about what happened in Worcester, about what happened in Hackensack. What happened, what happened to Brett Tarver in Phoenix, Arizona? That's a responsibility. If you were on this job, that's your responsibility to know that. Because the day you don't, it could be you. No, that's strong. Uh, we don't, uh, your article, you don't know what you don't know, which you've kind of started touching on. But uh, you talk about the proverbial 20-year guy who's had a lot of experience, but he's never really evolved, doesn't want to learn. What advice do you give someone who has that guy riding next to him in the engine? You know, how do you deal with someone who who refuses to learn or, or doesn't want to learn? What's your, what's your leadership style for that? I think you got to put your arm around them and help them. Uh, they're not doing that because they're bad people. They're just doing that because they've never had an awakening moment to realize that they may need to take that next step to get more experience or learn something new. I, I, I would have not had that awakening moment if it wasn't for June 18th. And I always try to get people to do it the most professional way possible because you chastising that person or making fun of that person or something like that, that's not good for anybody. It shows that you're not a quality leader and it really shows that you're not about helping them. You're more about making them look bad and you're about yourself. And that's one thing that I really am disappointed in a lot of times because we're there to pick each other up. We're there to help each other. Everybody throws the word around, Hey brother, Hey brother, but we're the first one to beat our brother down. We're the first one to say something negative about him or her. And that's unfortunate. If you have someone in your organization 
that it is that way, they're not bad people. They may have never had someone say, hey, I'd like to help you. I'd like to show you this. And just start a conversation with them. Give them some information. Start talking about leadership. Start talking about um, fire flow or fuel path or uh, uh, all of that stuff. That's what's that's what really gets the conversation going. Now, if you start the conversation, they blow you off. There's only so much you can do. But then say, well, I tried and say, thank you. I appreciate our conversation. But if you ever want some help, I'll, I'll be here to help you. You just got to stay professional. There's no reason to to not do that. Right on, right on. Uh, the uh, mark of an educated mind. Uh, this is one of the articles I pulled out of, um, from you. The mark of an educated mind is the ability to entertain an idea without accepting the idea. And I That's love that. I think it's Aristotle that you quoted when you said that. I could be wrong. So don't, don't quote me on my quote of Dr. David Griffin. But that being said, I wanted to talk to you about what you referenced as Manson's, Manson's Law of Avoidance and let you talk about it for a little bit. Well, I want to kind of go back to the point that you just made, because sure. um, when you talk about this, you really have to understand that you need to evolve. And, and the evolution of um, a leader is very difficult. When you start to avoid different topics or you start to avoid um, the knowledge that you don't have, it's it's very glaring in the way that you lead. It's very glaring in the way that you speak with people. And that's something that I have really tried to focus on because I I avoided a lot of information for a long time because it intimidated me and I didn't know specific words or I didn't understand them. So I just avoided that. I, I avoided reading, reading certain um, studies because I didn't understand what um, gigajoules were or anything like that. And I had to go and actually look at myself in the mirror and say, man, you don't know very much. And um, I sit here today and I literally say that every day. I, I don't know very much at all. And you probably don't either, but unfortunately there's people out there that actually think they do. And, um, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, I'm not an expert. I don't profess to be one. Um, I know I have a lot to learn and I know that you don't know what you don't know until you don't know. And then it's too late. And a guy named uh, John Buckman told me that one day after a class, he's been in the fire service for probably longer than I've been alive. And, um, super big mentor of, I've, I've read his information over the years and watched him speak. And, he pulled me to the side and he said, you know what happened on that day, David? And I said, I said, what? And he said, you didn't know what you didn't know. And it was too late. And he was right because I was trying to pump an engine, throttling up, calling for more pressure. And I had no idea what volume of water was. I didn't know that I needed a large diameter hose. And um, I blame myself for that. I don't blame anybody for that. I don't blame my organization or the people I worked with. I, I could have easily gone out there and and taking classes on pump operations or read a book or read a magazine, but I didn't. So I, I take that as a personal responsibility. Um, when you avoid things, you are not going to improve. All you're going to do is continue to reduce the knowledge that you have and people around you are going to surpass you eventually. And then it's going to be very, uh, very hard for you to continue. Reduce the knowledge that you have. You're actually reducing, man. That's great. <clears throat> um, pulling my notes back up, getting them going. The uh, man, oh yeah, Manson's law of avoidance, uh, negative filtering, repetition. Uh, a big thing, like you touched on in one of your articles about learning, is that we have a tendency in the fire service to learn something new. We do it a few times, and that's it. Then we go on to the next thing. You know, there is no repetition to mastery, or, or so. Go ahead. Sorry. So I relate that to the four levels of mastery. So there's a book by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. It's called On Combat. And he's not the one that coined these four levels of mastery, but he's the one that I heard it from. So the four levels of mastery, it starts with something called unconscious incompetence. You are unconsciously incompetent when you don't know what you don't know, which many of us have been like that in our career. I was like that the other day on shift. I didn't know what I didn't know. And then I learned it in the middle of the shift. And I'm not afraid to say that. So when I learned something in the middle of that shift, I became in the second piece of the four levels of mastery, which is called conscious incompetence. I was now consciously incompetent. I knew what I didn't know. Right. But with that, if you don't have the motivation as an adult learner to take it from there to the level of conscious competence, which means you go to school, you get more experience, you ride with other individuals, you have conversations at the kitchen table, you get out of your organization and go to other organizations that's when you become consciously competent, but you're not at the highest level of mastery, which is the fourth level, is unconscious competence, where you can perform a very hard skill 
at a very high rate of speed, at a very high level of stress, but you don't look like you are. I'll give you an example of this. I love boxing. I love MMA. It's really the only two sports I watch today. When you watch these guys, especially boxers, when you watch their hands and their head movement, their head movement is so quick. They can slip a jab or roll under a hook or something. They're so quick at doing that. They didn't wake up that morning and do a couple slips or a couple rolls under jabs or, or under hooks and just magically figure it out. It's because they're slipping punches 500 times a day. They're rolling under hooks 500 times a day. They're doing it so much it's in their sleep. So as soon as that boxer goes to throw that cross, they're slipping. They're rolling. It's unconscious competence because they, re they repeat it over and over and over again. When I fought mixed martial arts, I'd probably throw five to 600 punches a day. It was so bad in my last two weeks of a fight camp, I would throw so many punches that in the middle of the night, I would literally start shadow boxing in my sleep. And that is not an exaggeration. Wow. My wife would wake me up and she's like, sweetheart, because my body was so used to doing the same movement over and over again, it just subconsciously took over. And that's what it has to happen in something like firefighting, or I use the example of MMA. When you get into something stressful, as my MMA was, you don't even know you're doing that. It was like I was outside of the cage watching myself. I'm throwing combinations or slipping punches or I'm on the ground rolling jujitsu. And half the time, I didn't even know what happened. I'd watch the fight the next day and I didn't even remember half of it. You go to a stressful event, you're throwing a ladder for a rescue. If you've thrown a ladder one time that year, yeah. it might not go up as easy as if you threw it a hundred times that year or right. as efficient where you're not really thinking about it. You're just throwing the ladder. You're talking the person down. You're helping them get down because you have that level of unconscious competence. The problem is you can use both examples, the MMA, the boxing, or the firefighting. When you get to a point to where you think you're so good, you go to the fifth level of mastery, which is argument of, uh, argue, argued as complacency oh, because really? you stop training. You stop throwing punches. You stop slipping. You stop rolling. Why? Because you're like, I got it. I'm the champ now. I don't need to do it. I saved somebody yesterday. I don't need to throw a ladder for six months. But that's not the case. That's when you even have a higher responsibility to be better. And that's really what the four levels of mastery include. I've not heard the fifth level. I've never heard that. That's, that's The really fifth level is from some additional research I did. So the four are the ones that are coined before Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. I did some research after that, and there's some arguments that there is a fifth level of mastery, and that would be complacent because human behavior shows once we master something, we become quite bored easily. Oh, yeah. We want a new challenge, and we go for that new challenge while simultaneously our skill set on the other pieces are now reduced because we have perishable skills. And once you let the perishable skill lapse, it's not as easy to come back. No, that's strong. That is strong. I love that. I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> no problem. I, I stole it from Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Awesome. Uh, where are we at? I'm looking for my notes here. Uh, hard charging. Uh, the, you know, I got it. Join the storm. Join the storm or move to the golf course. It's a quote I wrote down. So I loved it from you. It's a, it's a, go ahead. I'm really adamant about the modern environment and this isn't a job that you retire and do you you do the job that's that's the point I'm, i i don't i've never really been an understanding person of that um when i retire i'm going to retire and i'm going to go and probably uh do something else and still try to help people in any way that i can but um, i'm going to let the younger generation take their turn and, and do and do their thing and, and lead to the best of their ability and um this isn't a job to where you can retire in place and and let everyone else do the work and it just doesn't work out real well. And you've seen that in organizations across the country and um, it just, it just doesn't work. And what I mean by that quote is you have to have that fire. You have to have that hunger for this job. And once you lose that hunger and that fire to really help and serve the people that you work with, that's when it's probably time to make a change. And it's important because you're hurting a lot of people in an organization. And um, it's, it's disappointing. I've been to some organizations to where, you know, the first thing they say is that we'd be much better off if this person was in this position or that position. And that, and that hurts my heart because they're, they're supposed to be on the same team. They're supposed to be working together. And if that's happening, then how is it going to be a high functioning atmosphere uh, for that organization? And that's something that's very difficult to overcome. No doubt about it. Now, you are a multifaceted individual and you have something called uh, industrial athlete. Uh, do you want to talk about the industrial athlete? 
I feel like we're industrial athletes. I mean, we're professional athletes. We go to somebody's worst day of their life and we have to be able to function um, at, at, at that. And I, I live what I speak. Um, if you ask the guys I work with, I do absolutely insane workouts. Um, I do that because if I'm going to ask you to be able to do something physical, I have to be able to do that at 40 years old. Um, if I'm in the BC vehicle and something physical is happening and I have to step in, I have to be able to help in whatever method I can, because I believe that's the walk I should walk. If I'm going to preach uh, physical fitness and mental health and professionalism and look the part and be the part, I feel like that's just who I am. Now, if someone doesn't do that, I'm not saying that makes me a better person than them. That's just the way my mind operates. It's, it's just the way that I was raised. It was the way that I was always taught to be very physical. And the other side of that is it really helps me with my mental, um, my mental ailments, I guess you would say, with post-traumatic stress that um, it allows me to get a lot of that anxiety and a lot of that stress out of my system. Um, so a lot of the workouts are so self-induced of exhaustion and uh, really pain that when I'm done, I don't have a whole lot of energy left and I can't be, I can't be stressed out. So it's probably not the best thing to do, but um, it's better than drinking alcohol and doing drugs. So right on, fine. right on. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, I wanted to ask you, I didn't know if, uh, if someone had wanted to start a uh, peer support program or something in their department, uh, do you have uh, advice to them of way to start that? Absolutely. We had a great individual that was brought into our organization and started the peer support team. And he's grown that uh, throughout our organization. I'm a small part of that peer support team. We have um, fire, firefighters on there. We have assistant chiefs, battalion chiefs. We have captains. We have retirees. Uh, if anybody on the call wants any information, all they have to do is email me and I'll get them in contact with the person that's the director of our low country firefighter support team. Um, he's very good at what he does. He was the one that actually steered me to get um, the mental health help that I received after the fire. And um, that's what allowed me to be able to overcome that and, and continue to be working today. So I assure you, it's a very good program. Awesome. Oh, uh, do you, you care about sharing your email address? Uh, my email is uh, dr and then my name, David Griffin at gmail.com. Perfect. So if you need that information, that is awesome. So I always like to ask my guests if they have, and I know you're well read, uh, if they have book or books that they think firefighters should read, wh whatever genre or anything. So I'm always interested in finding new books to read. I'm a huge nerd. I, I read a lot. And that's uh, in part because of obviously I'm just a nerd. And then my wife, she actually got me into reading some novels because she, she nice. realized I read a lot of serious books. And I'm very, um, I'm very intellectually minded, if you will. I can sit and think about things and analyze things for way too long. Um, so she turned me on to some books. So uh, the first one I read was by Thich Nhat Han. I know it's hard to uh, say that, but it's uh, Peace is Every Step. You might not be able to see it. Uh, probably not because of my background, but Peace is Thich Nhat Han, Peace is Every Step. It's called The Path of Mindfulness in Everyday Life. And that's something that I've been uh, teaching on um, recently is mindfulness because um, from post-traumatic stress, we become um, so disconnected with what's going on in real life. We're living in the past or we're living in the future instead of living in the present moment. And mindfulness means I am very mindful of what's going on right now. I know I'm talking to you on this podcast. I know I have people that are watching me for, uh, on this podcast and I appreciate that. It means that I don't take it for granted. It means that um, it's not about me. It's about the, um, the conversation that we're having and hopefully that someone that's watching this will maybe get some help or do something to uh, better themselves. And that's really what mindfulness is. It allows you to uh, be in the moment. And I've learned over my life that I, I want to do that. I want to be in the moment. I want to um, enjoy my life. I mean, today I, I do the grocery shopping for my family now because for the last eight years of my life, I've lived on an airplane in hotels for about, I don't know, 200 days a year. Um, so I've switched it up. I now I'm now the, the stay at home daddy, if you will, because I'm not traveling as much, which has been a choice of mine. And I'm very thankful for that. But it's teaching me how to have peace. I, I haven't had peace in a long time in my mind. And uh, I'm just getting to that point and 14 years afterwards. And uh, I hope people understand that. I, I think some people look at me and think I have it all figured out. And I, I don't. I'm just like them. I, I just happen to be uh, on a different part of my journey than I was a few years ago. Nice. So with that being said... I'm reading a book by uh, Clive Cussler. Yes. So Dirk Pitt is yes. my hero. Absolutely. So Dirk Pitt is. You got to pick up Clive Cussler. 
I feel like I'm Dirk Pitt because I see myself in Dirk Pitt. I see the way that I lead. I see the way that I respond to certain things and the belief I have in really taking care of your team and taking care of your people. Um, and that's who Dirk Pitt is. So Clive Cussler wrote probably 20 or 30 books about uh, the adventures of Dirk Pitt. Um, it's gotten so bad that my neighbors around here actually call me Dirk. Nice. Um, one of my neighbors, he didn't know what I did. And uh, he thought I was some kind of like um, black operative guy that went off in the middle of the night and came back a couple of days later. So he kind of turned me on to it. So really good book. And I'll tell you this, don't watch any of the Clive Cussler movies. Uh, the movies do not do the books justice. Although Matthew McConaughey wasn't terrible uh, in, in whatever that was, Sahara or whatever. Yeah. 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 So, no, I love Clive Cussler. I love Dirk Pitt. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, did I cut you off? Is there other books you wanted to suggest? Uh, the, the one I'm going to start tonight after we get off is a uh, Mitch album. It's the next person you meet in heaven. Uh, so it's a novel by him. He's written so many good books. Uh, I've read probably, let's see, I read Tuesdays with Maury, The Five People You Meet in Heaven, um, Have a Little Faith. And uh, On My Journey of Peace, I'm trying to find uh, to this day. That's it's part of what I read. And uh, he always has a good perspective and allows me to think about things differently. Nice, nice. Excellent, man. You You are the first, I want to say, there might be a firefighter, uh, a fictionalized account maybe but you're the first person who suggested like a pure fiction book so i love it it's so bad that i told my wife that i'm actually thinking about writing a series like dirt pit but for firefighting because all the, the four books that i've written are all serious and they're very right. deep just they're heavy books and I, I need some not so heavy in my mind and uh, i'm thinking about doing something like that uh with the character that helps a lot of people with their post-traumatic stress. So uh, we'll see where that leads. Maybe. That'd be awesome, man. Hey, I, let me know. and I'll be a proofreader for you. Absolutely. I'll need it. That's awesome, man. I love it. I'm excited. All right. Uh, what was I, I, I get sidetracked by Clive Cussler. Um, I'm going to say on the scrap, every time we do a thing called the five questions for firefighters. All right. And it's completely, the answers are completely your opinion. There are no right or wrong answers. The points are arbitrary and they're passed out by me. Absolutely. And so Dr. David Griffin Chief, are you ready for the five questions for firefighters? I am ready. All right. So question number one, what is the number one issue facing the modern fire service? Well, the modern fire service right now is facing a pandemic, which is really uh, decreasing their budgets and it's making them hard to, to function as they want as an organization. There's organizations around the country that are having to lay firefighters off, uh, close stations, uh, brownout stations, it's, it's really tough to see that. And we as a fire service community have to understand that we're trying to get through this the best we can, like all the other organizations are. Um, but currently that's the biggest issue. All the other stuff is second to me right now, because if you don't have the funding and what you need to focus on the all hazards job we have, then we're not really going to do a successful job at that. Mm. No, that's very relevant. Very relevant. The first person to ever mention the pandemic in the, in the current, uh, you know, as the current issue facing number two, what is the thing you are most excited about for the future of firefighting? Young, hungry firefighters that are ready to come in and make a difference. I, I love seeing that. I have in my, in the battalion that I'm responsible for, I have young captains. I have one that's an older captain and he's very helpful with me and I love it. And then I have the other younger captains that I can tell they're very hungry. They're very eager very eager and they're learning and they need a uh, mentorship and they need help. Just like I need help from uh, the assistant chief that I look for mentorship and he does a great job um, with that. But I think it's exciting to see where they can make the changes that maybe we have failed or faltered in our careers, because I know that I've made numerous mistakes and I failed as a leader and I will continue to do that. And I hope from um, the failures that I have, and hopefully I have some successes too, that they see that and, and maybe try to make it better. And I hope they, I want them to do it better than that. We did it. I want th it to be better for them. I want right. them to have benefits. I want them to have better retirement, more sick time, more vacation, better pay. I, I want all that for them. So when I'm an old guy sitting on my porch, smoking cigars, I can look back and say, man, these guys, they did, they did it right. We set them up and then they took it and ran with it. And that's what the ultimate uh, pride for me is to see that because that's, that's why I go to work every day. Uh, -uh. I work there and I will work there till I retire. I will not go somewhere else. I will not jump to another department because I want another bugle on my collar. And it's something that I'm very um, proud to say, because in my 
time the last eight years, there's been opportunities for me to go to other places and do things. And I, it's not even a conversation to me. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with trying to make sure that you mentor the young people in your organization that you've seen come through the ranks that have worked so hard to get to where they want to be. And eventually it's your job to get them there. So then when you walk away, you knew you helped them out. Mood, I love that. And I love the passion in your answer, man. That's That just pours through when you start getting on something you uh, care about. Because it's more than just... What you just said is way bigger than leave it better than you found it. You articulated it so much better than that. And, and so <clears throat> awesome, awesome answer. Number three of the five questions for firefighters, according to Dr. David Griffin, is what is the best rank or position to have in the fire service? That's a personal choice based on where you are in your journey as a career. When I was a firefighter, I literally said I'm never going to do anything but ride the back. And then I saw people doing pump operations and I was really intrigued by that. So I tried it and I said, man, I love this job. I love to drive. And then I saw people as a captain and said, man, it would be pretty neat to have your own crew one day to work with them. And so then you tried that. And so I think it's all personal where you are in your journey and the position I'm in right now, I am so blessed. I literally can't wait to come to work every day. Um, as you probably can see, uh, some people probably think I'm a huge nerd because of that, but um, when you've gone through something like we've gone through and you've had people tell you in your life, uh, medical professionals have looked at you um, early on after the fire and said, you probably should retire. Uh, you don't need to continue working. Um, and 14 years later, I'm still riding on a rig every day. And our, as are 68 other people that I ride with, um, that's powerful. And that uh, really sticks out to me because they're proud to be in the position they're in. They're proud to be serving whatever job they serve at that current time. So it's all, all where you are on your journey. All right. All right. I'll take, I'll take all where you are on your journey as an answer. The, uh, I did like, I love, I love your daily posts. Well, I say, but the, it's the steel writing, the hashtag steel writing. I do love those. Those are very inspirational. Just to, just to, uh, tag on there. Uh, best advice you have ever received. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. I saw that in a movie and I, my dad articulated to that, that to me when I was a young man. And I really took that to heart. And I always, whatever I set out to do, I want to be the best at that. And it has nothing to do with anybody else or being better than anybody else. It's because I am so hard on myself. Um, when I make a mistake, it, it destroys me. It, and I, and I still fight that today. And I mean, the guys that I work with, I think they realize that if I make a mistake, I mean, it'll bring me to the point to where I got to like talk to them and they help me get through it because I'm so passionate about um, what I do is I don't want to waste the talent or the, the opportunities that I had. And I've gone through times in my career where it ebbs and flows. And I feel like that, you know, maybe people don't really um, understand why I do what I do or why I am the way that I am. Sure. But I don't want to waste my talent. And more importantly, I don't want to see the people in the organization I work with. I don't want to see them waste their talent. I want them to be great. I want them to be great captains and great battalion chiefs and great deputy chiefs and great assistant chiefs and great fire chiefs. I want them to all be great. I always tell everybody we're all on the same team. And when we start to not see that point and we don't work together and there's little clicks in here and there, right. it's it just doesn't work for the betterment of the organization. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. All that other stuff is just white noise. If we're not working together to make it better for our people, then what are we doing? Saddest thing in life is wasted talent. I like that. Excellent. The final question is heavy fire, searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? I'll go nozzle because that's what mostly I did as a, as a fire, as a firefighter and a captain on a rig. We really didn't do a lot of VEIS while I was on, um, while I was on an engine after we started doing that, I was past that point, I guess you would say. Sure. So I would say the nozzle because that's how I learned from my captain. That's when they were on the nozzle and I would follow them. Um, and they really taught me a lot. You know, my first fire, I was scared to death. I had never been in a fire before. Um, I was on a very small hose line and, I followed that captain in and he showed me how to do it. And I was blown away. I was like, this guy is Superman. And so I wanted to be just like him. And that's why I would pick the nozzle. Man, it's hard to knock the nozzle. You can't knock the nozzle. Sure. Awesome. There it is. The five questions for firefighters, according to chief David Griffin, uh, brother, it's been an excellent talk. Uh, let everybody know, uh, the best place to contact you, reach out, buy a book, book a class. Uh, I know you're slowing down on your speaking engagements, but best place to get that stuff. 
I'm not really slowing down. It's just I'm taking, um, I'm being smart with how I schedule okay. because I need to uh, focus on some other more important things in my life. Um, but all that said, I, I'm not here to like plug anything or do anything like that. So you see my name on the screen. All you got to do is use a Google thing and you can find it. But I'm not plugging any of that stuff. I'm here tonight because I, I'm hoping there's one person listening that uh, they learned something from leadership and they learned something from my mental health talk that maybe they'll call a counselor or maybe they'll start mentoring their people better. And all that other stuff is, it's just, it is what it is. Very fair. Very fair. That's awesome. Uh, a couple things I want to talk about. I got a coin sent to me from Pheasant Country. Michael Olson trying to get it on there, see if it'll snap. But uh, I always appreciate the coins people send. I always try to show them off. Pheasant Country Fools. Uh, the president there, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, on the back. Very simple back. I love it. Protect the brotherhood. Nice. Remember the fallen brothers. Everyone goes home. Nice. Do the right thing, man. I love this coin. I love the simplicity of the back so much. I may even put it in the, the flag case back there with that side showing. But this side's actually pretty cool. So thank you so much for those. If you want me to show off a coin, uh, contact me. Send it to me. I will show your coin off and add it to You can see my, my collection is slowly growing. Um, on the... Benefit conference for the, the fallen Wainoka firefighter brothers. I am working hard to find a venue. There's been some slowdown in trying to find a venue. When, as soon as I get that venue locked in, I will let people know because there's been a lot of outpouring of support uh, to, to help that make that conference awesome and make it happen and make it raise a lot of money for the families of those fallen brothers. So that's uh, everything coming up. We got March 21st, Jeremy Dunch of National Fire Radio. And March 25th, Bill Carey is going to be on. Those are the upcoming guests on The Scrap. And today, you got Dr. David Griffin speaking to you about leadership and everything else. So, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. For all those, thanks for the comments, questions. Uh, I hope the tone stays silent. Unless it's burning, everybody stay safe out there. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Thank you. Take care.